Hi, welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Mike Parker, and since 2008, it's been my privilege to be the instructor for this class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures, teachings, and history of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Time and location are available on the class website. There's a link to that in the show notes just below this video. Also on the class website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for the content on these sites. What you're about to see is a recording of my notes for one of the lessons. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And please feel free to subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. My friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and the authority and keys that he held are now vested in the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And most importantly, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. I hope you enjoy this lesson. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at Doctrine and Covenants sections 4, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 18, and 19. Joseph Smith received these eight revelations in response to requests from his family and friends that they might know the will of the Lord concerning them. They were received in Harmony, Pennsylvania, in Fayette, New York, and in Manchester, New York, between February and August 1829. During this time, Joseph and Oliver completed the translation of the Book of Mormon and were preparing the manuscript for publication. In early February 1829, Joseph Smith Sr., the prophet's father, and Samuel Smith, the prophet's younger brother, visited Joseph Jr. and Emma Smith in Harmony. During their one-week visit, Joseph Jr. received a revelation directed to his father. Although this revelation is traditionally understood in the context of missionary work, Joseph Sr. was not called as a missionary. It applies to all who embark in the service of God in missionary or any other labors. It begins with the declaration, quote, Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men, unquote. This is the first time in this dispensation that the Lord had revealed the coming forth of his marvelous work. This phrase comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Isaiah 29, verse 14, King James Version, quote, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid, unquote. Isaiah's prophecy had a powerful effect on the Book of Mormon prophet Nephi, who likened it to his own people and to the record he wrote. Nephi applied Isaiah's prophecy to his own prophecy of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. This book would be the start of God's marvelous work and wonder, one that would lead to a spiritual outpouring upon the world and an ushering in of God's messianic kingdom. The prophet's revelation to his father also listed 10 qualities that Joseph Sr. was commanded to remember. Doctrine and Covenants 4, verse 6, quote, Remember faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence, unquote. Why these 10 attributes? According to the Apostle Peter, they lead to having one's calling and election made sure. 
2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 10, King James Version. Quote, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall." Unquote. Because Christ has provided us everything pertaining to life and godliness, we must develop the disciplines associated with virtue. If we seek after and attain these virtues, our calling and election will be made sure, and we will enter into the Lord's heavenly kingdom. The prophet's revelation to his father adds one additional virtue not mentioned in Peter's letter, humility. As we discussed in the last two lessons, this quality was essential for Joseph and his associates to possess as they began the work of the restoration. In late May, 1829, after John the Baptist had appeared and ordained Joseph and Oliver to the Aaronic priesthood, Joseph Knight Sr. came to Harmony, bringing some desperately needed provisions, including writing paper, so Joseph and Oliver could continue the translation of the Book of Mormon. Joseph Knight was the father of a large family in Colesville, New York, about 15 miles or 24 kilometers north of Harmony, Pennsylvania. In late 1826, two and a half years earlier, Knight had hired Joseph Smith to help him with farming and mill work. While Joseph was employed by Knight, he met, courted, and married Emma Hale. Knight lent Joseph his carriage so he could visit Emma in Harmony, and again when Joseph went to retrieve the plates from the hill in Manchester, New York, in September 1827. The members of the Knight family were enthusiastic supporters of Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, and the Restored Gospel. They became great friends of the Smith family. In 1842, Joseph Smith reflected on Joseph Knight Sr., who was then nearly 70 years old. Quote, While I contemplate the virtues and the good qualifications and characteristics of the faithful few, of such as have stood by me in every hour of peril for these 15 long years past, say for instance, my aged and beloved brother, Joseph Knight Sr., who was among the number of the first to administer to my necessities, while I was laboring in the commencement of bringing forth of the work of the Lord and of laying the foundation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For 15 years, he has been faithful and true and even-handed and exemplary and virtuous and kind, never deviating to the right hand nor to the left. Behold, he is a righteous man. May God Almighty lengthen out the old man's days and may his trembling, tortured and broken body be renewed and the vigor of health turned upon him, if it can be thy will consistently, O God. And it shall be said of him by the sons of Zion, while there is one of them remaining, that this man was a faithful man in Israel. Therefore, his name shall never be forgotten." Unquote. Joseph Smith later wrote that when Joseph Knight came to Harmony in May 1829, he was very anxious to know his duty as to this work, so the prophet inquired of the Lord for him and obtained as follows. DNC 12, verse eight, quote, and no one can assist in this work except he shall be humble and full of love, having faith, hope, and charity, being temperate in all things, whatsoever shall be entrusted to his care, unquote. The world often regards humility and meekness as vulnerabilities or weaknesses but the Lord regards them as essential virtues. Without an acknowledgement of our total dependence on God, we cannot serve him effectively. This is his plan, his gospel, his spirit, his work, and his glory. To be temperate is to be moderate in the indulgences of the appetites and passions, and cal cool, calm, not violent. Examples of temperance that we could be practicing include 
not getting too much sleep or too little, not eating too much or too little, and not spending too much time at work or in one's calling or not enough time. The word of wisdom and other commandments that Joseph Smith revealed are forms of temperance that keep us from indulging in harmful excesses in our lives. At the end of May, 1829, Joseph Smith's older brother, Hiram, came to Harmony to visit Joseph and Oliver. Hiram was enthusiastic about the translation of the Book of Mormon, and he asked Joseph if he could make copies of the manuscript and begin preaching and teaching from it in the surrounding area. At Hiram's request, Joseph inquired of the Lord through the Urim and Thummim and received for him the following. With only slight variations, the text of section six, verses one through nine, a revelation received a month earlier for Oliver Cowdery, is the same as section 11, which was directed to Hiram. Also, the revelation to Oliver in DNC six, verses one through six, is the same as DNC 12, verses one through six, the revelation to Joseph Knight Sr. we just discussed. DNC 6 verses 1 through 5 to Oliver is identical to DNC 14 verses 1 through 5 to David Whitmer. Further, DNC 6 verse 6 is similar to DNC 14 verse 6, and DNC 4 verse 1 is similar to the opening verses of sections 6, 11, 12, and 14. What are we to make of this? Is this a divine form letter implying a less than personal concern for the recipients? On the contrary, it emphasizes the importance of the principles contained in these verses to those who receive them. Just because the words of the baptism ordinance and the ordinances of the temple are identical for all who receive them makes them no less important or personal. We can therefore consider the nine verses in section 11 as a commission to all who accept the gospel and desire to do the work God calls them to perform. DNC 11, verse 6, quote, Now, as you have asked, behold, I say unto you, keep my commandments, and seek to bring forth and establish the cause of Zion. Unquote. The building up of Zion is one of the major themes of Joseph Smith's early revelations, and it became his central focus after the church was established and the first missionaries were sent to Missouri. We're going to explore this theme in detail later in this course. For now, it's sufficient to simply mention that the objective of establishing Zion was already being revealed at this time, even before the Book of Mormon translation had been completed, before the Melchizedek priesthood had been restored, and before the Lord's Church had been established. DNC 11, verse 9, quote, Say nothing but repentance unto this generation. Keep my commandments, and assist to bring forth my work according to my commandments, and you shall be blessed. Unquote. Does say nothing but repentance unto this generation mean we should preach only the principle of repentance and nothing else? Certainly not. Elder Joseph Fielding Smith suggested that in this passage, the Lord wishes that all that we say and do might be in the spirit of bringing the people to repentance. The Book of Mormon prophet Alma commanded the priests he ordained at the waters of Mormon to preach nothing save it were repentance and faith on the Lord. After Alma was made high priest over all the churches in Zarahemla, there was nothing preached in all the churches except it were repentance and faith in God. DNC 11, verses 16 and 21, quote, Wait a little longer until you shall have my word, my rock, my church, and my gospel, that you may know of a surety my doctrine. Seek not to declare my word, but first seek to obtain my word, and then shall your tongue be loosed. Then, if you desire, you shall have my spirit and my word, yea, the power of God unto the convincing of men. Hiram was told to be patient, to study the portions of the Book of Mormon that were being translated, and to wait for the Lord's church to be established before going out to teach. One commentary on the Doctrine and Covenants explained, quote, you cannot preach what you do not know, Hiram had to wait to read the Book of Mormon and the Revelations of Joseph. Then he would be prepared to teach them to others. Only then could he preach by the Spirit and thus have the power to convert the honest in heart. In God's kingdom, one first has to learn the gospel and then be called to, by authority 
to preach it. Unquote. Hiram Smith would go on to declare the Lord's word by serving six missions between June 1831 and April 1833. He would later serve as a counselor to the presiding bishop, a member of the Kirtland High Council, a counselor in the presidency of the church, church patriarch, and assistant president to the church. Joseph Smith recalled, quote, Shortly after commencing to translate, I became acquainted with Mr. Peter Whitmer Sr. of Fayette, Seneca County, New York, and also with some of his family. In the beginning of the month of June, his son, David Whitmer, came to the place where we were residing and brought with him a two-horse wagon for the purpose of having us accompany him to his father's place and there remain until we should finish the work. He proposed that we should have our board free of charge and the assistance of one of his brothers to write for me, as also his own assistance when convenient. Having much need of such timely aid in an undertaking so arduous, and being informed that the people of the neighborhood were anxiously awaiting the opportunity to inquire into these things, we accepted the invitation and accompanied David Whitmer to his father's house, and there resided until the translation was finished and the copyright secured. Unquote. Oliver Cowdery was a friend of David Whitmer's. On his way from Manchester, New York to Harmony, Pennsylvania, Oliver had stopped at the Whitmer family home and told them about Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. Oliver promised David that he would report back on what he learned once he had met the prophet. By the end of May 1829, Joseph and Oliver were suffering from persecution in Harmony and were on the brink of starvation. The Whitmer's invitation to come to their home was a tremendous blessing. After Joseph and Oliver had arrived in Fayette and recommenced the translation, Peter Whitmer's three sons, David, John, and Peter Jr., asked the prophet to inquire of the Lord concerning their duties, and Joseph received revelations directed to each of them. D&C 14, verses 6 through 7, quote, Seek to bring forth and establish my Zion. Keep my commandments in all things. And if you keep my commandments and endure to the end, you shall have eternal life, which gift is the greatest of all the gifts of God. Unquote. What does it mean to endure to the end? Some individuals believe that it means reaching the end of one's rope and then tying a knot and hanging on. The scriptures, however, describe it differently. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. For whosoever has been born of God overcomes the world. These passages speak of persevering, conquering, and being victorious over temptation and the call to give up and join the prideful who are in the great and spacious building that the prophet Lehi saw in his visionary dream. Enduring to the end means being faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, continuing and remaining in the covenant until death. Overcoming the world does not require individual perfection in this life, but it does require persistence in striving to live the gospel. Do not think that there will be fewer trials for us to endure as we get closer to becoming true disciples of Christ. The Lord revealed to Brigham Young, quote, my people must be tried in all things that they may be prepared to receive the glory that I have for them, even the glory of Zion. And he that will not bear chastisement is not worthy of my kingdom, unquote. And Apostle Neil A. Maxwell taught, quote, the road of discipleship is not easy. It requires sturdy, all-weather souls who are constant in every season of life and who are not easily stalled or thrown off course." Unquote. D&C 15 and 16 verses 1 through 2, quote, Hearken, my servant John, and listen to the words of Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Redeemer. For behold, I speak unto you with sharpness and with power, for mine arm is over all the earth." Unquote. Sharpness doesn't refer to piercing or stabbing, but rather to clarity, acuteness, discernment, and perception. 
This definition is important for understanding Joseph's counsel in Doctrine and Covenants section 121 on reproving betimes with sharpness. Moving now into section 18. This section is associated with the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood. Joseph Smith did not make explicit the manner and timing of that restoration in his history. It appears that he understood it as more of a process than a single event. Let's review what we know. On 15th of May, 1829, John the Baptist appeared as a resurrected being and ordained Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery to the Aaronic priesthood. In early 1839, Joseph recalled that John, quote, said this Aaronic priesthood had not the power of laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, but that this should be conferred on us hereafter, and that he acted under the direction of Peter, James, and John, who held the keys of the priesthood of Melchizedek, which priesthood, he said, should in due time be conferred on us, and that I should be called the first elder of the church, and he, Oliver Cowdery, the second, unquote. John the Baptist made three promises to Joseph and Oliver, namely that at some future time, they would receive the power to give the gift of the Holy Ghost. They would be given the Melchizedek priesthood. They would be called as the first and second elders of the Church of Christ. These promises were fulfilled over a process of time. Let's look at how Joseph recalled their fulfillment. By early June 1829, Joseph and Oliver had moved to the Whitmer home in Fayette, Seneca County, New York. In his 1839 history, Joseph recalled, quote, we found the people of Seneca County in general friendly and disposed to inquire into the truth of these strange matters, which now began to be noised abroad. That is to say the translation of the Book of Mormon. Many opened their houses to us in order that we might have an opportunity of meeting with our friends for the purposes of instruction and explanation. From this time forth, many became believers and were baptized, whilst we continued to instruct and persuade as many as applied for information. We now became anxious to have that promise realized to us, which the angel that conferred upon us the Aaronic priesthood had given us, namely, that provided we continued faithful, we should also have the Melchizedek priesthood, which holds the authority of the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. We had for some time made this matter a subject of humble prayer, and at length we got together in the chamber of Mr. Whitmer's house, in order more particularly to seek of the Lord what we now so earnestly desired. And here, to our unspeakable satisfaction, did we realize the truth of the Savior's promise, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For we had not long been engaged in solemn and fervent prayer when the word of the Lord came unto us in the chamber, commanding us that I should ordain Oliver Cowdery to be an elder in the church of Jesus Christ, and that he also should ordain me to the same office, and then to ordain others as it should be made known unto us from time to time. We were, however, commanded to defer this our ordination until such times as it should be practicable to have our brethren, who had been and who should be baptized, assembled together, when we must have their sanction to our thus proceeding to ordain each other, and have them decide by vote whether they were willing to accept us as spiritual teachers or not, when also we were commanded to bless bread and break it with them, and to take wine, bless it, and drink it with them, afterward proceed to ordain each other according to the commandment, then call out such men as the Spirit should dictate and ordain them, and then attend to the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost upon all those whom we had previously baptized, doing all these things in the name of the Lord." Unquote. Highlighting the key points of Joseph's recollection, he and Oliver were anxious to have the Melchizedek priesthood and were praying earnestly in early June, 1829, in the chamber of Mr. Whitmer's house, the upstairs room where they were translating the Book of Mormon, for that promise to be fulfilled. It was at that moment when the word of the Lord came unto us. 
Joseph Smith referred to the miraculous answer they received in his 6 September 1842 letter to the saints in Nauvoo, which is now Doctrine and Covenants section 128. In it, he asked rhetorically, now, what do we hear in the gospel which we have received? And responded with a list of divine revelations that included, quote, the voice of God in the chamber of old Father Whitmer in Fayette, Seneca County, unquote. To him, clearly, that event was a key step in the process of the restoration of the priesthood. Joseph indicated in his 1839 history that the commandment for him and Oliver to ordain each other as elders should be deferred, quote, until such times as it should be practicable to have our brethren who had been and who should be baptized assemble together when we must have their sanction to our thus proceeding to ordain each other, unquote to observe the ordinance of the sacrament, to ordain other men, and to give those who had been baptized the gift of the Holy Ghost. These took place on the 6th of April, 1830, when the Church of Christ was organized. Joseph also declared that the resurrected New Testament apostles, Peter, James, and John, had ordained him and Oliver Cowdery. This visitation first was first mentioned in 1835 in what is now Doctrine and Covenants section 27. A shorter version of section 27 had been received in the summer of 1830 and published in 1833. In it, the Lord promised to soon, quote, drink of the fruit of the vine with you on the earth and with all those whom my father had given me out of the world, unquote. In August 1835, an expanded version of this revelation was published in the Doctrine and Covenants that included a list of ancient prophets who would participate in that great event and who hold various keys of authority. Among these prophets were the three leading apostles during Jesus's earthly ministry. DNC 27 verses 12 through 13, quote, and also with Peter and James and John, whom I have sent unto you, by whom I have ordained you and confirmed you to be apostles and as special witnesses of my name and bearing the keys of your ministry and of the same things which I revealed unto them, unto whom I have committed the keys of my kingdom and a dispensation of the gospel for the last times and for the fullness of times in the which I will gather together in one all things, both which are in heaven and which are on earth." Unquote. According to the Revelation, Peter, James, and John were sent to ordain and confirm Joseph and Oliver to be apostles and a special witnesses of my name and bear the keys of your ministry as apostles, to bear the keys of my kingdom and a dispensation of the gospel for the last times. In other words, what Peter, James, and John restored specifically were the keys of apostolic authority, which include the keys of the kingdom of God on earth. These keys are held today by the apostles at the head of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Only the prophet and president of the church can use all of these keys. In a revelation given to the church in October 1831, the Lord confirmed this. DNC 65 verse 2, quote, The keys of the kingdom of God are committed unto man on the earth, and from thence shall the gospel roll forth unto the ends of the earth, as the stone which is cut out of the mountain without hands shall roll forth until it has filled the whole earth." Unquote. In his 1842 letter that I referred to earlier, Joseph Smith also mentioned the visit of Peter, James, and John as part of the progressive succession of revelations that had been at the center of the Restoration. DNC 128 verse 20, quote, And again, what do we hear? The voice of Peter, James, and John in the wilderness between Harmony, Susquehanna County, and Colesville, Broome County, on the Susquehanna River, declaring themselves as possessing the keys of the kingdom and of the dispensation of the fullness of times." Unquote. Joseph Smith never stated when Peter, James, and John appeared to him and Oliver Cowdery, but his reference in this letter to the event taking place on the Susquehanna River between Harmony, Pennsylvania and Colesville, New York, allows us to pinpoint when it may have happened. According to Joseph Knight Sr., 
Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery made an overnight round trip between Harmony and Colesville in late May 1829. This would have been within a few days after the appearance of John the Baptist on the 15th of May. This is the most likely setting for the appearance of Peter, James, and John and the ordination of Joseph and Oliver at their hands. Joseph and Oliver left Harmony, Pennsylvania for Fayette, New York at the start of June 1829 and did not return to the area until the end of April 1830. Both men had been ordained elders and apostles before the church was organized on the 6th of April 1830 and possibly as early as June 1829. These factors suggest that Peter, James, and John appeared to Joseph and Oliver in late May 1829. Returning to the Revelation in section 18. In early June 1829, Joseph Smith received a revelation in which Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer were told the following. DNC 18 verse 9, quote, And now, Oliver Cowdery, I speak unto you, and also unto David Whitmer, by the way of commandment. For behold, I command all men everywhere to repent, and I speak unto you, even as unto Paul, mine apostle, for you are called even with that same calling with which he was called." Unquote. Setting aside whether Oliver and David had been formally ordained by this time or not, this passage is the first suggestion in Joseph Smith's revelations that apostolic authority was in the process of being restored to the earth. This revelation also contains a magnificent statement on individual worth. DNC 18 verses 10 through 16. Remember, the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh. Wherefore he suffered this pain of all men, that all men might repent and come unto him. And he hath risen again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. And how great is his joy in the soul that repenteth. Wherefore you are called to cry repentance unto this people. And if it so be that you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring, save it be one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my father." Unquote. How great is the worth of a soul? It could be measured by the cost incurred to redeem it. The Book of Mormon indicates that Christ's atonement was infinite. His suffering and the extent to which he paid for our sins cannot be measured. Therefore, the worth of each individual person must also be infinite. It's no wonder then how great the Lord's joy is in the soul that repenteth. Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, quote, If we could truly understand the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would realize how precious is one son or daughter of God. We would strive to emulate the Savior and would never be unkind, indifferent, disrespectful, or insensitive to others. If we truly understood the atonement and the eternal value of each soul, we would seek out the wayward boy and girl and every other wayward child of God. We would help them to know of the love Christ has for them. We would do all that we can to help prepare them to receive the saving ordinances of the gospel." Unquote. The revelation also commanded Oliver and David, quote, contend against no church, save it be the church of the devil." Unquote. That's DNC 18 verse 20. What is the church of the devil in this context? Some Latter-day Saints mistakenly believe that it refers to either a specific religious denomination or to any church other than the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Elder B. H. Roberts of the First Council of the Seventy taught, quote, I understand the injunction to Oliver Cowdery to contend against no church, save it be the church of the devil, to mean that he shall contend against evil, against untruth, against all combinations of wicked men. They constitute the church of the devil, the kingdom of evil, a federation of unrighteousness, and the servants of God have a right to contend against that which is evil, let it appear where it will, in Catholic or in Protestant Christendom, among the philosophical societies of deists and atheists, and even within the Church of Christ, if unhappily it should make its appearance there. But let it be understood 
we are not brought necessarily into antagonism with the various sects of Christianity as such. For so far as they have retained fragments of Christian truth, and each of them has some measure of truth, that far they are acceptable unto the Lord. And it would be poor policy for us to contend against them without discrimination. Wherever we find truth, whether it exists in complete form or only in fragments, we recognize that truth as part of that sacred whole of which the Church of Jesus Christ is the custodian. And I repeat that our relationship to the religious world is not one that calls for the denunciation of sectarian churches as composing the church of the devil. All that makes for untruth, for unrighteousness, constitutes the kingdom of evil, the church of the devil. All that makes for truth, for righteousness, is of God. It constitutes the kingdom of righteousness, the empire of Jehovah, and, in a certain sense, at least, constitutes the Church of Christ. Latter-day Saints who attack other religious denominations violate the Lord's commandment given in D&C 18, verse 32. They run the risk that, by adopting Satan's methodology of argument and contention, they themselves may become members of the Church of the Devil." Unquote. This revelation also included the first indication in the, this dispensation that there would be 12 apostles who would fill the same role and office held by the ones in the New Testament. D&C 18, verses 26 to 28 and 37 to 38, quote, And now, behold, there are others who are called to declare my gospel, both unto Gentile and unto Jew, yea, even twelve, and the twelve shall be my disciples, and they shall take upon them my name, and the twelve are they who shall desire to take upon them my name with full purpose of heart. And if they desire to take upon them my name with full purpose of heart, they are called to go into all the world to preach my gospel unto every creature. And now behold, I give unto you, Oliver Cowdery, and also unto David Whitmer, that you shall search out the twelve who shall have the desires of which I have spoken, and by their desires and their works you shall know them." Unquote. Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer were commissioned to seek out 12 men who would fill this role. Martin Harris's life was still not in order at this time, but in 1835, Joseph directed that Martin should also assist in choosing the 12. It would take nearly six years before the instructions given in section 18 were fully implemented. The Quorum of the Twelve Apostles was organized in February 1835. Sometime before the 25th of August, 1829, the Prophet Joseph received a revelation that is now canonized as Doctrine and Covenants section 19. This revelation was directed to Martin Harris and concerns Joseph Smith's attempts to secure a printer to publish the Book of Mormon. The Joseph Smith Papers website gives the historical context. Quote, in June 1829, before this revelation was dictated, Martin Harris and Joseph Smith talked with several printers in Palmyra and Rochester, New York, about printing the Book of Mormon, finally settling on E.B. Grandin of Palmyra. John H. Gilbert, the compositor who assisted Grandin in estimating the cost of the project and later typeset the Book of Mormon, recalled that Harris initiated the negotiations and planned to pay for the printing. Gilbert also remembered that Grandin would not begin work or purchase the needed type from the foundry until after Harris had promised to ensure the payment for the printing. Grandin's price to print 5,000 copies was $3,000, which would require Harris to impart essentially all of the property to which he had legal right. Printing it began in September 1829. Joseph likely dictated the text of this revelation sometime after the negotiations in June and before the 25th of August, 1829, when Harris mortgaged his property to Grandin as payment for the publication, thus apparently fulfilling the revelation's injunction to pay the printer's debt." Unquote. This revelation includes some strong language directed at Martin Harris. The Lord introduced himself as, quote, Alpha and Omega, Christ the Lord, Yea, even I am he, the beginning and the end, the redeemer of the world." Unquote. In D&C 19, verses 4 through 12, the Lord strictly warned Martin, 
quote, And surely every man must repent or suffer, for I, God, am endless. Wherefore, I revoke not the judgments which I shall pass, but woes shall go forth, weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, yea, to those who are found on my left hand. Nevertheless, it is not written that there shall be no end to this torment, but it is written, endless torment. Again, it is written, eternal damnation. Wherefore, it is more express than other scriptures, that it might work upon the hearts of the children of men altogether for my name's glory. Wherefore, I will explain unto you this mystery, for it is meet unto you to know even as mine apostles. I speak unto you that are chosen in this thing, even as one, that you may enter into my rest. For behold, the mystery of godliness, how great is it! For behold, I am endless, and the punishment which is given for my hand is endless punishment, for endless is my name. Wherefore, eternal punishment is God's punishment, endless punishment is God's punishment." Unquote. Martin Harris was still exhibiting the same faithlessness that had resulted in the loss of the 100 manuscript pages of the book of Lehi. In this revelation, the Lord was forthright with him regarding the consequences of his sins if he did not repent. The Lord reminded Martin that every man must repent or suffer. This warning was not intended to be harsh or threatening though, he told Martin and all those who are chosen that these words were given that you may enter into the Lord's rest. Some readers have struggled with the statements in this revelation about the torment and punishment of the damned being endless and eternal. How do we reconcile these statements with later revelations, which teach that nearly all individuals will receive some degree of God's glory? President John Taylor explained, quote, I have read statements from men which were really terrible when depicting the state of the damned. It is bad enough, but it is not the kind of thing they represent. Is there justice? Yes. Eternal justice? Yes. Have we eternal punishment? Yes. What is it? It is God's punishment. Are there everlasting prisons? Yes. What are they? God's prisons. Do people stay in them forever? No, not in all of them. We have prisons upon the earth, penitentiaries, in which to confine people for one, five, ten, or twenty years, as the case may be. And when their time expires, they come out. But the prison is st there still. Is it an everlasting prison? You may call it so if you please, but people do not stay in it always. Has God a way to manage his affairs? Certainly, the judge of all the earth ought to be at least as capable in the management of his affairs as mortal men are in theirs." Unquote. The following year, President George Q. Cannon of the First Presidency taught, quote, We believe there is an endless hell. We do not, however, believe that human beings are consigned to it eternally. The hell may be endless and the punishment endless, but it does not follow that they who are consigned there are to remain in it eternally. The conclusion these two leaders came to is that God's punishment is called endless because God himself is endless and punishment for sin is an eternal principle that never ends, not because those who sin will endure it for an endless duration. This gives context to the Lord's statement in D&C 19 verse 10, endless is my name. Regarding the damnation in verse 7, some Latter-day Saints have understood that damnation is like a dam. Just as a dam stops water, damnation stops one's eternal progression. The words damned and damned, however, come from two different sources. It's just a coincidence that they sound the same in English. Dam, the barrier, comes from the Old and Middle German word meaning to dam up, to hinder, while damn, to cast out, comes from the Latin word meaning to damage, hurt, harm, condemn. Damnation is condemnation, not stopping. The Lord's warning about eternal punishment was followed by his plea to Martin to repent. D&C 19 verses 15 through 19, quote, Therefore I command you, Martin Harris, to repent, 
Repent, lest I smite you by the rod of my mouth, and by my wrath, and by my anger, and your sufferings be sore. How sore you know not, how exquisite you know not, yea, how hard to bear you know not. For behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, and to bleed at every pore, and to suffer both body and spirit, and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father, and I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men." Unquote. The Lord's plea to Martin to repent is underscored by the passionate and moving account of the suffering he experienced in carrying out his great atonement. I don't think it's necessary to read verse 15 in the sense that the Lord was threatening Martin or us, the readers. Rather, he was pleading with Martin and us to repent so that he didn't have to experience the suffering that is the unavoidable consequence of sin. This revelation concluded with a commandment to Martin. DNC 19, verses 26 and 34 to 35. Quote, and again, I command thee that thou shalt not covet thine own property, but impart it freely to the printing of the Book of Mormon, which contains the truth and the word of God. Impart a portion of thy property, yea, even part of thy lands, and all save the support of thy family. Pay the debt thou hast contracted with the printer, release thyself from bondage." Unquote. Martin followed the instructions in this revelation and mortgaged his farm to raise the $3,000 required by the printer. This was roughly equivalent to $101,000 in 2024. The Book of Mormon was offered for sale starting on the 16th of March, 1830. Martin Harris personally took to the streets of Palmyra to sell copies at $1.25 each, or about $42 in $24. That concludes this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download these notes and this slideshow. In our next lesson, we'll discuss the founding of the Church of Christ in the spring of 1830. The reading is sections 20 through 24 and 26. See you next week.